The following episode discusses issues surrounding terrorism in the United States and abroad. It was recorded before the San Bernardino shootings. Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Trevor Burrus. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today are co-authors of a new book, Chasing Ghosts, The Policing of Terrorism. John Mueller is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute and he is a member of the political science department and senior research scientist with the Mershon Center for International Security Studies at Ohio State University. Mark G. Stewart is professor of civil engineering at the University of Newcastle, Australia. Welcome to Free Thoughts, gentlemen. Thank you. Nice to be here. Thanks, Evans. Your book kind of begins, I mean, as most terrorism discussions begin with 9-11. What was the mindset immediately post 9-11? What was the mindset of the the defense security establishment about terrorism? Well, it was just hysterical. Basically, they were finding uh, ghosts that we call them, but terrorists under every rock. Uh, In in 2002, they were telling journalists there between two and 4,000 al-Qaeda operatives at loose in the United States and the, the number we now know is very close to zero. So they're in there. They were constant. Everybody, everybody seems to have been in intelligence ready and worrying about an immediate um, second wave, which never happened of course. Trevor Were you ever able to fig- figure out how they got this 2,000 or 4,000 number? Trevor Burrus No. It's, well, that's, that's sort of the hysterical aspect of it. They were apparently finding them all over the place. Or the thinking they're finding them. They talk about we hear them talking to each other, and there's a few cases where they might have done that. But what's bizarre is people haven't gone back and said to these people, you know, where you you should ask the intelligence community, where did you come up with two to four thousand? I mean, it's just not like off by a factor of four or something. It's off by a huge amount. Is there a sense that they were intentionally inflating that number, or just so paranoid in the months and years immediately following that they just weren't? I guess thinking rationally if the number's yeah. off by that amount. I, I think the latter institutionalized paranoia and you get reports people are saying that everybody believed that, everybody in the intelligence, which is bizarre. You think there's a few people saying, well, you know, maybe there won't be a second wave. Maybe they, don't, they aren't all there. I mean uh, George Bush opens his book saying that uh, in, you know, right after 9-11, the, um, uh, 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 the, uh, the director of the FBI comes in and says there are 300 – we know there are 331. Um, uh, Al Qaeda operatives working in the United States, and uh, Bush is writing his book ten years later, and he doesn't say whatever happened to those three hundred thirty-one. <laughs> it never, it, so the thing is, that no one goes back to these people and saying, "How where'd you get? How come you're so bad? How so wrong?" Is the security establishment as such that you could have this kind of swirling misinformation where no one knows where anything actually comes from. Everyone seems to believe that it's two to 4,000 al-Qaeda operatives because their friend in the next cubicle told them that and their friend in the next cubicle yeah. told them that and that's just basically the source of the belief is sort of a self-sustaining delusion that they all work off of and they can't gainsay. Yeah, that's a, that's a, main pro- that's a major problem in intelligence basically. You're – Tied into a small number of people who can look at the classified intelligence. The classified intelligence is overwhelming, so that's all you read. That's all they read, and uh, you get into this mindset. Nonetheless, it's, it's absurd that no one was saying uh, maybe maybe there won't be a second wave. Maybe the, maybe we've overestimated them. That should just be a hypothesis. Who knows? You can't be sure, but you'd think somebody would would say that. Uh, a year after 9-11, uh, I did an article in – it was in National Interest and got picked up as an op-ed by the Washington Post uh, suggesting that maybe 9-11 was an outlier, that it was a, not a harbinger but basically a, a, an aberration. Uh, I didn't say it was. You know, I just said we ought to consider the possibility that, you know, that it might be an aberration. Um, and uh, they published it in the, in, the, in the National Interest and it was labeled a 9-11 provocation. That someone could, is a very provocative that you could even bring up the possibility that this was an aberration, uh, and uh, so that was sort of, that was very much the mentality, and it, and it continued on. Why would it be an aberration? If it is an aberration, it seems odd that it would be given how common terrorist attacks are all over the world. Yeah, well, there hasn't been that much in the whole world outside of out of war zones. Uh, it seems to me there's maybe two to four hundred people killed each year by Muslim extremist terrorists outside of war zones each year, and that that include London and Bali and um, and um, Mumbai and so forth. So it's not that there's a whole lot of it going on. And uh, there's the countries like Canada or Australia, obviously, that have found virtually none. 
Yeah, yeah, and it seems that this observation is never really made publicly. I mean, I think I think the the, the politicians don't really like to think about that. They just want to think about what what might happen next, rather than actually what is happening and what does the data actually show us and what's the evidence. But we often get the sense. I mean, we hear stories in the newspaper that it seems like the U.S. government is always stopping another attack. You know, we, we're constantly hearing stories about the FBI arrested this particular guy who was planning something or we're told you know, there was a threat and then the assumption is and therefore government stopped it. So if you take you know, the, the front page of the major newspapers at face value, it does feel like there's a fair number of threats on a fairly regular basis and we've either just been lucky or really good. There's a extensive sections of the book dealing with the homegrown the, the terrorists who have, who have plotted supposedly been arrested or have actually uh, consummated violence in the United States. And the more you look into these cases, the more pathetic and, and uh, trivial they become. Many of them, have, over half of them, have had an FBI informant who has been egging the would-be terrorist on. That doesn't mean, of course, that terrorist wouldn't have figured it out on his own completely, but there, that seems to be a very common phenomenon. Uh, and uh, there's there's a British movie called Four Lions, which I strongly recommend, which basically seems to get much closer to what the average terrorist is, lot, is like. Uh, basically, four bumbling or five bumbling actually terrorists in uh, in Britain, uh, by um, uh, directed by uh, Chris uh, Chris Morris, and. Um, so anyway, it's it's uh, when these things do get put forward, they they do tend to be exaggerated. The, the police want to indicate that what they might have done, and uh, that what they what they had intentions of doing, and they often had grandiose schemes like toppling the Sears Tower, things like that. Uh, left less uh, commonly talked about is. The fact that they didn't have the remote capacity of, to do it and that most of them didn't even know where Chicago was. So. <laughs> what is the – you open up your book discussing the um, threat matrix and the sort of briefing system of the establishment. How, how did that – how did that system and how does that system work? Yeah, it, it came out – I talked to one former CIA guy, CIA guy uh, Glenn Carl, about it and he said it, it emerged initially – uh, because after 9-11, George W. Bush said, give me your 10 most wanted list for terrorists and they didn't have anything like that. And so oh, literally overnight, they invented the threat matrix. And what it is is any squib of information, any tip in other words, that might lead to terrorism has to be examined and it gets put in this massive matrix. Um, and uh, it, it, uh, the, uh, the number of tips the FBI and other government agencies have followed up since 9-11 is well over 10 million. And uh, the number – we know certainly the number of those who have proved, 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 proved fruitful and they're incredibly small. And then when they do prove fruitful, frequently the people you actually end up with are rather pathetic losers who are unlikely to do much of anything, though they did have the right – they did have the terrorist type of mentality in them. Um, and what seems to happen um, – there's a very good book on this by uh, Garrett Graff called the FBI uh, – he called it uh, – called the Threat Matrix about the FBI. And uh, he goes into chapter and verse about these tips coming in and, and you basically are surrounded by them all the time and you just you – know, your whole life is on these tips and many of them are horrible, you know, nuclear weapons in the Bronx and things like that. Uh, the fact that hardly any of them pan out to be anything is, is less less considered. Um, and there's also a book, good book by Jack Goldsmith, um, a, a, a Harvard law professor who came in somewhat later after 9-11 into the Republican administration and said that you know the, the, you read this stuff and it literally scare you to death every single day. And uh, he, talk, he, he quotes that, – that's a fairly direct quote from George Tennant who was head of the CIA and, and Goldsmith says that's the, that's the view of everybody who ever read the th threat matrix. So you're living with this stuff and you're scaring yourself to death and no one says, this is an awful lot of crap, right? Uh, and, and maybe one, there isn't anything out there. My favorite one is the uh, um, one entry in this uh, quoting from the book. Uh, one entry in the threat matrix is crisply cited as, quote, a threat from the Philippines to attack the United States unless blackmail money was paid. It turns out that this entry was based on an email that said, Dear America, I will attack you if you don't pay me nine 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 dollars mwa ha 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 ha. Right. Is, that, is that a fair – is that representative of the kind of threats or is that a little bit yeah, more extreme? No, I think it's, that's pretty representative because every – people have written about this and they say every squib of information
information goes in. Previously, what would happen, something like that, say this is some nutcase and uh, you know, some kid in the Philippines who's got his finger on the nine key, uh, <laughs> which it basically was. The FBI had it, but, they, but they, from the get-go, they, every single tip has to be followed up. And I talked to one top FBI official just a year, uh, just a few months ago, and I mentioned this. I said, do you still do that, follow up every tip? And he said, unfortunately, yes. And he said that twice, unfortunately. And so even people within the FBI seem to think that maybe we could do our, use our resources better by only examining some things uh, by, by basically triaging the tips, which is what they did in the past. But everything gets followed up and many of them are bizarre. Uh, very, very common is people sending in tips because they're trying to get even with somebody. You know, my ex is a terrorist. He's also a communist and he's also a prevert. <laughs> and so you, but you have to follow it up. Hmm. Do you have a favorite uh, the of the threat matrix? I mean, that was that was definitely my favorite. But um, in terms of that that dichotomy between uh, the stories that were told, Aaron mentioned um, these stories that come out and say we recently captured a terror cell wanting to topple the Sears Tower, which I mean, I'm just picturing that in my mind as bizarre by itself. But right. um, you know, or uh, the transatlantic flight or the bomb in Times Square. Do you have a favorite one in terms of the biggest difference between the story that was told and then the actuality of the story? And you too, yeah. Mark, if you have a, a different favorite one. Yeah, mine would probably be that Sears Tower one. Um, the guy – I mean it's a really interesting case when you get into it. What's really fascinating, I did a case book which is available on the web called Terrorism Since 9-11, The American Cases. So there's about, 50, about 60 cases in there and they're, they're all worked out in a fairly elaborate case studies. And it's been, it's been really interesting to write the book because each of these cases is different. Each are, many of them are just you know, bizarre beyond belief. In the case of the Sears Tower case, what happened was this guy goes into a Yemeni grocer – and says, you know, I'd really like to be connected to Al Qaeda. Can you help me out? <laughs> <laughs> you just happened to see one on the street. So. <laughs> well, Yemenis, they must know all about Al Qaeda, right? Good, yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, so the Yemeni grocer helps him out, and he also tips off the FBI because he's actually an FBI agent <laughs> or informant. He just happened to find a Yemeni grocer who was an FBI informant. Yes, right, informant, right. Yes, okay. right. And, or he was tied in, or he was sort of on the pipeline for the FBI. So the FBI, is, uh, you know, sigs a um, informant on him, and this guy has this little little uh, um, uh, group of about seven or eight people. He's mostly a failed businessman in Miami, but he used to be in, from from Chicago, and he's trying to create his own religion and so forth. And he also thinks that he might be able to get some money out of Al Qaeda. So the operative comes in and says, "Hey, you want somebody from Al Qaeda?" The Yemeni grocer told me, "Here I am. I'm from Al Qaeda." Um, and even the, some of these informants are really clever. Uh, and this guy, for example, right at that time, Osama bin Laden sent out a message saying, uh, this, uh, we're, very soon there's going to be a big attack in the United States uh, because we've got people working on it. And so the informant tells this guy, he's talking about you. You're already world famous. <laughs> um, and, and the guy basically, his argument is, um, to make it, turn it around further, that he was actually trying to con the, he needed money desperately and the guy was constantly dangling tens of thousands of dollars of potential from – because Al-Qaeda of course got deep pockets and so forth. <laughs> uh, not as deep as the FBI but nonetheless. Um, and his idea was basically we'll just uh, uh, string this guy along. That's what he says today. We'll string this guy along and get the money. We won't do anything of course. And as he gets pushed further and further, he gets uh, more and more um, voluble. Um, and he comes up with this idea of what we want to do is go to Chicago, which at least he knew where that was. He was from <laughs> Chicago. They have gold and mine, and then we'll blow up the Sears Tower, and then it'll topple over and fall into Lake Michigan, creating a tsunami, <laughs> <laughs> which will then wash back. <laughs> on. I'm, I'm sorry, I feel like I'm laughing too hard at this, but continue. <laughs> All this is totally true, um, and then it'll wash back on Chicago. Downtown, uh, and there's a big there's a jail there, and it'll destroy the jail. And from that, we'll free prisoners, and with it, we can create a new Moorish nation. And someone asked him in the trial, "Where'd you come up with that?" And he said, "Oh, it's a movie or something like that." <laughs> so the informant says, "Wow, that's really interesting. Um, but maybe we should start with something a little bit easier." <laughs> and so then they have this idea: well, we're going to bomb the FBI headquarters in in Miami. 
And the the plot ends up basically in an, in an incredibly bizarre way. Somebody should make a movie of this. Uh, the uh, in order to humor this guy who's trying to create a new religion, uh, the FBI informant says, "Well, uh, uh, they, they would bring in an expert on creating religions from Chicago." Uh, at, at, at the request of the, the guy who's doing it. So he comes in. That's a strange and, expertise. Yes, yes. right. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have an it's expert a, in it's this. from the south side of Chicago <laughs> okay. where lots of uh, religions have been created over there. You know, <laughs> it's a, a hot spot. Um, so he comes in and he brings his wife who he calls Queen Zebediah. <laughs> and um, and uh, so he, he walks in and he's, he's basically a live wire because he immediately spots – the uh, unlike these guys, spots the informant as an informant. So that guy's from the FBI. And they start to get really antsy. Say, yeah, that's right. And, they, and the plot starts to break up. So this long period of time in which they're trying to get this plot worked out uh, the, by the police is about to go down the tubes. And then the informant – then the informant gets – I mean not the informant but the, the Queen Zebediah husband uh, guy gets into a gunfight with one of, the, one of the guys and shoots him. So he gets arrested. No one gets killed. He gets arrested and then he tells the police, these guys are about to do terrorism, uh, which is totally nonsense. And so then the police swing into action. They arrest the, the arrest of the group, and it went to trial twi- three times. It failed twice, and then finally the guys got um, got um, uh, imprisoned. Do you, still a, there. do you have a favorite one, Mark? Uh, on the Sears Tower is, is also my favorite because um, when you read about the media, it sounded like it could really happen. Mm-hmm. So the first first thing I thought was, well, this must be really a tall building. <laughs> 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 so, so you know, so then I then I went to Google Maps just just to see where it was. And it would, it would actually have, have to topple over and then slide downhill for more than a mile. <laughs> it would actually hit the lake. It's possible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it must be, re- one must be a really steep hill. <laughs> it's, it, it, it's kind of astounding, but, but you know, we're laughing here. But, um, you know, we are also recording this a few days after the horrible attacks in Paris. So we, we – I mean how do you – when people say we're being too flippant about this? Uh, well, some, sometimes they get, they get lucky. 9-11 was getting lucky big time. And uh, – but – no one else has. I mean, there's been very few successful attacks, and the um, the worst one in the United States has been the uh, shooting at Fort Hood, when, uh, which killed about 13 people. Um, so the, the damage is obviously unacceptable, but it was it was quite low. Um, and the other cases where there's been, you know, the one guy tried to ram a uh, tried to kill people by uh, driving through the University of North Carolina campus and dr- running over people, and he missed everybody somehow. And then he telephoned saying, "I did that," and they arrested him. Uh, anyway, the, most of you look at the, 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 the what's strange about the cases is they're serious in the sense that these guys are not phonies; they really believe this stuff. What's comical is their incapacity to do much about it. But it, and if you look at them all and say, you know, if you if all these guys had succeeded in what they're doing, I mean, what they're practically capable of doing, which would not include taking down the Sears Tower, um, but if they were capable of, do, of doing something, how much damage would be done? And it's likely pretty small because they're just not very competent. Um, and so, uh, but sometimes you get lucky. Nine Eleven was they got lucky, and as and of course in the Paris thing, the Paris thing is also if the information is not very fully out yet, but it looks like a guy who had who had set up several other terrorist attacks in uh, Europe, all of which became were abysmally fa- failures. So finally, he got it right, unfortunately, tragically, uh, and uh, put together this this plot. If, if the current news reporting is correct on that, we can this. This incompetence seems odd, given, you know. So maybe maybe toppling the Sears Tower is really hard, but getting a gun and shooting up a lot of people seems to be, I mean, just based on the last few years, something that Americans are pretty good at. Yes. Um, and and so why? I mean, is, is even that beyond the capacity of these people? And well, if so, why why are they so bad at it? Well, it's, it's obviously some of these school shootings and so forth have killed far more people, and they're just by kids uh, than than all the the terrorist plots. M- many of them have visions about getting guns and and shooting people. Some of them have actually had experience with guns. Many of them have not. Uh, most of them have angled their way more toward um, toward explosives because they think that's more. I don't know why, because it's much more hard, more difficult to do. Uh, and they also get tied in with the FBI informants. So that there's one guy in Baltimore, for example, who emailed or posted on Facebook that he was looking he wanted to do jihad, and he wanted to uh, um, have the uh, uh, he, wanted, he needed help. He needed help, 
So he gets three messages. The first is from somebody telling him to stuff it. The second is from somebody trying to convince him not to do it. And the third is from an FBI informant and says, I just happen to have this car bomb in my garage and maybe we can work together and we can make beautiful terrorist music together. So they get connected and of course the guy eventually does try to use the car bomb. But uh, does not. Uh, but obviously, it's a dud, and and he gets arrested. So in their case, you got this guy. You know, it's kind of it's it's funny in a way, but it's also uh, dangerous in the sense this guy really did push the button, which he thought would blow up. A, in this case, a, a military recruiting station. Um, so they're they're serious in that sense, most of them. Uh, but their capacity is very limited. He never in a million. And he said he never in a million years would have been able to put together a bomb on his own. Have the number of threats or plots or stated intention to blow things up gone up as social media use has climbed? So you mentioned this guy just put it out on Facebook asking for help and one of the things that Facebook and Twitter and other social media sites do is make it much easier to broadcast threats, uh, make it much easier to have conversations with other people all over the place um, and so – Young men, especially angry young men, often have these rich fantasy lives about their own capacity and these elaborate plans that they're going to put together and whatever else. And so has social media – has it grown with that? And what portion of the threats that say the FBI is monitoring are people spouting off on Twitter? <laughs> Twitter didn't even exist very, not very long ago. Uh, and it, 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 there's been three or four different studies of this, uh, academic studies, and they basically conclude that this social media stuff is to the benefit of the police overall. It, uh, they, they, uh, communications, uh, they, 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 like this guy in Baltimore, they're able to pick up people, find people, um, and uh, use the evidence. They, there's about, it must be about a third of the cases involve – uh, some sort of social media. It, it, be, it doesn't have to be Facebook. It would be just having a website, uh, which frequently they would be able to put together and they, and they spout their views, which is perfectly legal, obviously, to spout your view. But then the implication is maybe they actually do something and then the FBI follows up. Yeah, and it's, it's also been – it has, as John says, been a big help to the police services. Uh, in Australia, quite regularly, the Australian Federal Police will pick up um, Australian nationals who are at the airport about to catch a flight you know, to five ISIS – because they were told all their, all their friends that they're going, and what, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, because they think it's a good thing, and so they're happy to tell their friends. And obviously, the, the police can, can can actually actually tap tap into that information as well. Yeah, so they don't they didn't have to talk to the friends; they just catch it yeah, in the electrons exactly. that's going through the air. And, and this is open. This is open. This is not spying. This is. I mean, this every anybody can look into Facebook. It's not a. <laughs> uh, restricted thing, particularly like again the bumbling. Yeah. So I've talked to people who have said. So I've talked to some people who've worked in the government of the more conservative bent, and they have said to me uh, when I've criticized our terrorist terrorism policy, they've said, "You don't know what it's like to see the threats uh, that are facing this country, and until you do, uh, you can't really have." So that's one version, and then and then on the same page, some people say, "Well, why do presidents?" Post-election, they often change their rhetoric from from being maybe somewhat you know less attacking on terrorists or saying this maybe more is a different, civil libertarian. more civil libertarian. But then when they get into office, they they stop that, and and someone says, well, it's because they see they they then they get the secret folder, so they see what's really going on, and so that's another explanation for this. And then another one is you wouldn't that, be thinking about Obama, would you? Well, exactly. <laughs> and then another one is 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 sort of the Dick Cheney explanation that we haven't had a terrorist attack because the intelligence establishment has thwarted tons and tons of these. Now we've addressed a bunch of this. Um, now it seems one of those three seems to be a more common opinion amongst – I don't know if it's scholars, uh, if it's more common amongst scholars, but amongst the defense establishment for the explanation for terrorist act. Yours is just that the simplest one. It's not that common. It's hard to do and they're kind of idiots. Uh, yeah, that's probably a pretty good summary. Well, <laughs> I think that it's actually easy to do I mean, I mean, you know, and that was touched on before. I mean – if people really wanted to, wanted to do harm, they could do so, you know, with with um, with, with guns, with with cars, like what happens, like happens, you know, in Israel. You just you know, you know, drive down a bus stop or tram stop or something. So the fact that it isn't happening sort of suggests to us that maybe there might be people out there who really wish us harm, no. because if, if they wanted to, they could do it pretty easily. 
Now, how do people react to that thesis though? I mean in the defense establishment and in the scholarship. Yeah. How do the scholars uh, well, they, they, line up on this? I, I, your first issue about them seeing all these threats and that's exactly what the threat matrix is. Yeah. You're, 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 you see all the threats and the question is – uh, no one is saying, you know, this is a lot of the garbage. Or even even ten, it says, even if half of them are wrong, it's scary. Well, come on, it hasn't been anywhere near half that have led to anything, and the, and the that quantitative issue basically doesn't even come up. Uh, overall, they, they they just get they get this institutionalized paranoia. So when they're talking about all this stuff, it's like that. What we tried to do is actually sort that out. Uh, what you have is first of all the disclosed plots. These are the ones we know about because they, they've been arrested in their court cases or – and or like the guy at Fort Hood. He actually did shoot, shoot, shoot somebody. Uh, then you get basically the, um, uh, the idea that there are these plots that are not out there, that are out there but they have been – that they've been stopped. And if there are any – but they didn't, get a, they didn't get arrested. And the question is if there's real plots, why weren't they arrested? And I talked to two people. One is Glenn Carl, and also also in the, uh, working with lots with the CIA is Mark Sageman. And they just basically say there aren't any of those out there. I can, if I can use the phrase, uh, uh, Glenn Carl says that who used to be in charge of net the threat assessment at the CIA when he was employed there says it's bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. So that's either three words or two depending on how you look at it. <laughs> and uh, he, he, I asked, can I use that? And he said, yes, yes, yes. Um, so then, then what happens is they do find a lot of little teeny plots that are just beginning and they also close them out frequently by arresting on something else. They can't – they don't – there isn't enough to arrest them on terrorism charges essentially. Uh, but there's – you know, they did check bouncing and, and, and or immigration violations. And so they, they do send these people out of the country if they're immigration violations or give them short prison cells, uh, prison sentences because for, you know, uh, forging driver's license or something like that. So there's a group like that. But those plots are even more embryonic than the ones that have come to trial because if they weren't embryonic, they would have come to trial because they would arrest them on terrorism charges. Um, so the, the so the question is: Are dealing with very em, extremely embryonic plots? Uh, and then there's the plot. Uh, then there's the plot, the issue about deterrence. There's people who don't who don't um, uh, do anything that they'd like to because we got those great security apparatus. Well, as Mark just said, it's very easy to do if you want to shoot somebody, and stab somebody, uh, throw a brick through a window. It's very easy to do. There's some things which is very hard to do, which is like commandeering an airplane. So in that in sense, uh, terrorists have not tried very hard to commandeer airplanes like 9-11 for good reason. It's very hard to do so. There's a lot of security barriers, both ones that are created because of the act and also because of the ones that put them by TSA. So this means basically, OK, one thing I can't do is commandeer an airliner. Now, the argument about deterrence is that if people – uh, agree that they can't do a, uh, uh, a airliner thing, uh, th then why don't they do something else? There's, as the Paris thing showed, an infinite number of targets. I mean, some of the people killed were just walking down the streets. They just drive by. They shot at a uh, at a, a couple of restaurants, and then on people on the street. I mean, you can't protect everything remotely. So the question is, they may be deterred from doing certain things like hijacking airliners, but they certainly could do other kind of terrorism. So the implication of this whole island line of reasoning about terrorism, about deterrence is that a terrorist says, you know, I want to be a terrorist. I want to – what do I want to do? I think I want to blow up an airliner. And then uh, they think about well, – that's really hard to do. OK, I won't be a terrorist. Uh, if that's what your idea of a dedicated terrorist is, namely he can't get his, he can't get his super prize and therefore he's not going to become a terrorist, what kind of a terrorist is that? I mean it doesn't show you exactly a whole lot of dedication. So the deterrence argument – Makes sense in the sense that certain things are off limits. Also, air, they would, many of them would like to shoot up um, military bases because their main motivation is anti – is basically from hostility to American foreign policy and that's really hard to do because military bases are not exactly easy targets. Yeah, that would be the last base yeah. I want to shoot up. Right. Yes. Yeah, right. yeah, though they still look but at they it. Still they, obviously, they do. do that, yeah. So, so essentially the deterrence thing that, that, you know, they may be deterred from attacking certain targets. But if they are deterred from all terrorism, which is you know is very easy to do, because they can't get certain targets, it's hard to see how they're they're really you know de dedicated terrorists. But that seems really bizarre because someone who really does want to blow up a plane, 
and then thinks they can. I, I, I was a little confused by your deterrence thing. They would be – wouldn't they then go into the shooting? I mean, yeah, they, that's what I hear. That's so, what they would do. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so, so they would they would be deterred from a certain target but they wouldn't – they shouldn't that, – that shouldn't deter them from doing terrorism. So we should see a lot more shootings right. almost and we right. don't. So that's interesting. Right. Yeah. Now what about – of course everyone here is thinking um, – here, uh, listening. Um, small probability, high cost. I mean you know, standard nuclear weapons. This has been a problem. This has been – it's talked about consistently. That people thought this would – one Harvard professor you quote said that he pretty much thought it was a certainty that this would happen. So there are bumbling idiots, all this. OK. But, but this is the one guy is all it takes for a nuke to be part in Central Park and then it's just game over at that point. Well, I'm sure it would be game over. But I did, did another book called Atomic Obsession, which is somewhat summarized in the Chasing Ghosts book. Um, the difficult. I mean, th these guys have had difficulty putting together bombs, um, and so um, I mean, this, for example, the um, marathon bombs at the, at uh, at uh, in Boston. Uh, they, you know, three bombs went, two bombs went off and killed three people in a crowded area. Uh, they, so they finally actually got a bomb to go off, but it wasn't exactly uh, terribly lethal. So the more I looked into it, the more the, the, the difficulties of creating nuclear weapons or stealing them or something are so horrendous that uh, they may have had – and many terrorists don't even have much interest in that. Uh, and basically if you're going to be successful, it's like in Boston, like in Paris, which is do things which are really pretty simple. But don't we have – isn't there a bunch of sort of rogue Russian nukes out there that are unaccounted for? It's a, um, a common idea. No. 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 <laughs> it's, it's like the suitcase bombs. Now, even if they are out there, they they, they, de they de demand constant maintenance. And so if they are not being used, they're just deteriorating essentially. But there, there seem to be very little evidence there are any out there. Now, what about and suitcase bombs? And suitcase bombs. Yeah, we talked about beforehand. But what about those? Do those exist? Yeah, that's, that's the same thing. They don't seem to even exist as far as I, I can see. I think um, I had read one time the Russians made one in the 60s that weighed like 180 pounds yeah. and was was a pretty small yield itself. And uh, yeah, I'm but sure. it, well, there may be some around, but they're not loose essentially. And it, it seems it, it's it's it it basically is not uh, uh, you know the the whole hysteria that came out after 9/11 about the nuclear weapons. They're really good with box cutters, therefore they must be able to make nuclear weapons. It doesn't exactly follow. How many – we've talked about the FBI being involved in counterterrorism and the CIA and NSA but it seems like basically everyone who works for the federal government now is in some way involved in counterterrorism or at least claiming they should get more money for counterterrorism. So outside of those three, what other agencies are involved and how is this all working? If you're spending something like $115 billion per year, there's a lot of – Agencies involved, a lot of snouts in the trough, essentially. Yeah, that's the other way of asking yeah. the question: is where's all the money going? <laughs> well, it's really hard. To, well, excellent question. <laughs> first of all, the definition of homeland security is so broad these days. So, so everyone, everyone wants to say they're, they're in, they're in that, that 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 nexus. So it covers things like you know um, immigration and, and custom, immigration, customs and border protection. The Coast Guard has a has a, has, a, has a substantial homeland, homeland security sort of role as well, so it's pretty hard to find a, a government department that actually doesn't have some aspect in in terms of homeland security in their role, and that's part of that's part of the issue is that there's a lot of money being spent in agencies that really don't have much ex expertise or much really capability in that area as as well. I mean, if you take if, if if you take the um, FBI has a budget of something like three billion dollars for counterterrorism, that's about three percent of the total federal spend essentially. Uh, that they're a fairly competent agency. They tend to be they're, they're, the, they're the lead agency for counterterrorism in the United States. They're responsible for most of the convictions and everything else. So even we wonder where does the other ninety seven percent. <laughs> go and what are they really achieving? Now, you're talking about the local police too. Yeah, um, I mean, um, local local police budgets on, on homeland security is no more than about one or two percent of the total police spend. So even even an agency like the New York Police Department, which is always in the media about about how they're they're the, they're the, they're the main role against counterterrorism and everything else. They only spend about two percent of taxpayers' money, of their, of their, their taxpayers' money, on 
on counterterrorism, and probably another two percent comes from the federal government in terms of protecting the UN and and, and, and grants. Does that indicate so, how much of a problem they think it is? Do you exactly. Think? So that so actually, when because you know, most police departments are funded by local taxpayers, and it sort of shows that local taxpayers are more concerned about crime and traffic violence, you know, traffic and much more mundane issues than actually terrorism. But, but and also – but if the federal government says we'll give you this money to chase terrorists, they're perfectly willing to accept it. <laughs> well, do we have a, a – <laughs> This is my kind of – Exactly. Take from other money, from you know, other brothers. In Eisenhower's speech, he warned about the military-industrial complex and he was, he was at the height of the Cold War and, and the actual sort of traditional nation-state model. Do we have like a terrorism-industrial complex? I mean yeah. mixed it with the military since 9-11? Yeah. yeah and I've called it the terrorism industry. Uh, and they're they're trying to get the money, but the the Eisenhower thing is really interesting in many respects because Eisenhower really believed correctly that, uh, as it turned out, uh, that the Soviet Union was not likely to strike the United States. It basically didn't want another war with or without nuclear weapons. And um, but he, and he was appalled at how much money is being spent on defense. And what he didn't say was. The threat isn't really that big. We don't have to spend that much money, which would be totally true as far as I'm concerned and I think as far as he is concerned. Instead, this what he is did – a general. It's a <laughs> yeah, <I think laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, he's on a peace stick. Yeah. But he, there's a whole bunch of evidence about him talking to friends and so forth. You know, they're not going to strike us. I've seen these guys at Geneva. Come on. They're not going to start nuclear they, – they, they might do subversion and stuff like that, class warfare. They're not going to start World War III. Come on. And he really believed that and he thought therefore we didn't need this huge defense establishment. But instead of saying that publicly, what he did say was that uh, the uh, – that uh, it, it's all basically done – through the influence, wanted or unwanted, of the military-industrial complex. So what he did was he attacked the messenger, the people profiting from it, but not their premise. And they said, yeah, but the Russians are going to attack any minute now. And if the Russians are going to attack any minute now, then you say, we've got to spend a lot of money on that. And, and so if, if you accept the premise, you're dead. Basically, the, the money is going to go. And the same thing is happening with terrorism now because uh, what we try to do is say the threat is really very limited, not zero. But limited, uh, and uh, so when when um, uh, you know uh, Cheney says these measures have saved thousands, hundreds of thousands of lives, and the ACLU says, um, well, yeah, but they've invaded our privacy. Uh, people say, well, wait a minute, For invading privacy versus hundreds of thousands of lives. You don't have much of an argument and the, the people attacking the NSA, for example, and other intelligence things, uh, rare, they, they basically keep saying legalistic arguments, the, the Fourth Amendment and so forth. Is it reasonable seizure? seizure? Is it search and seizure? Well, if the search and seizure saves thousands of lives, most people are going to say that proves that it was reasonable. <laughs> it's, it's not an abstract thing and you have to, you have to attack that argument. You can't just let Cheney say 100,000 people have been killed, lives have been saved uh, and they basically rarely do it. Uh, and uh, so they, and then it becomes an irrelevant argument. It's basically about something – you have to go after – like Eisenhower, attacking the military-industrial complex but not its premise. So the military-industrial complex in the Cold War and afterwards, we – you know, that was – we can see the incentives. We can see how these companies were making money. Like you know, you you inflate this threat, and then oh, well, that means we need to build a lot of planes and a lot of tanks and a lot of missiles and all sorts of other equipment. But for terrorism, who is profiting off of this, and what are they selling? What, and what are they trying to convince us to buy more of? Well, anything that the, the market will bear. If if they, the TSA or the uh, national or the uh, Department of Homeland Security says. We need a whole lot of X-ray machines. Everybody's got X-ray machines to sell. Is in Washington in an Augenblick, <laughs> uh, and when they get there, they say, you know, you don't really need these X-ray machines because the terrorism threat isn't so bad. They don't have much of an incentive to say that. So it's it's the it's the vendors who are creating it, and the, the, the you know, if I were selling X-ray machines, I'd be there. <laughs> I mean, that's my job. And I'll, who's it might they, they want the X-ray machines? I have X-ray machines. They're really terrific X-ray machines. And who, who am I to tell them? You know that we don't. They, that's their that's their problem. They say they think there's a need, so we'll supply the need. It's capitalism working, you know, perfectly. Well, I mean. <laughs> 
with the government. So that's, right. I mean, yeah, that's it's right. forced money. Uh, <laughs> Particularly if it's government money and it's yeah. free. You know, so, so when local police departments, when, when they're offered free money f- from the federal government, they say, oh, we, we, we wouldn't mind an armoured vehicle. That could be quite handy. You, may, you, may, you never know. Uh, and uh, then they say, well, actually, we, we might need a, you know, a boat and something else. And, and so it's like a shopping list. And that's the area yeah. that I, I yeah. wrote on. I mean, that, that's one of my areas that I wrote on our policy handbook about the militarization of po- local police, which came to light in Ferguson, but it was always directly tied. I mean, first it was the drug war. And then it was terrorism. Yeah, they're, they're, well, they're, their job is to suck as much money out of the federal government as they can. Same with mayors, of course. That's, uh, and uh, Mayor Bloomberg frequently when he comes up with a case, uh, twice in fact, he came up with cases which are, the, the culprits were so trivial that even the FBI he wasn't interested in them. Is that the, was the, one of those the Times Square bomber? No, no, no. They, they, that one actually happened. No one is a guy named Pimentel, another guy uh, which I call a, a pair of lone wolves. Because that's what they call them. So, yeah, I don't know if you can have a pair of lone wolves. But anyway, <laughs> that's what they call them, uh, who are going to bomb some synagogues and stuff. And in both cases, these guys, one guy in, in the synagogue case, one guy was certifiably crazy, and the other guy was uh, basically a loser, big time. And the FBI said these guys aren't worth going after. Pimentel, the other guy who was going to do pipe bombs, was similar. But anyway, they they they. Um, uh, they uh, arrest these guys, and they do have enough evidence eventually to convict them. Um, and uh, in, at least on our New York state laws, and uh, they then they then they sort of hype the threat. They say they give a big press conference and they show how a bomb that Pimentel was trying might make uh, might actually work and so forth. Uh, and then at the same time, they say we really need a lot of money down here in New York. You know, and they're, they're experts at wheedling money out of the United States government. And they have obviously because of nine eleven, of course, they have a, a good deal to work with. Now, for uh, for other for I wanted to ask about two more things because for listeners who, who aren't convinced yet of the threat inflation, uh, we talked about nuclear weapons. Now, dirty bombs. Mm-hmm. Uh, what about the problem of dirty bombs? Well, we keep waiting for that to happen. I mean, there's a big difference between nuclear bombs and dirty bombs. Nuclear bombs will kill people. Dirty bombs won't. That's a big, um, that is a big difference. Yeah, so we, oh, you know that. It's, it's, right, it's right there on the surface. Uh, what they can do is cause an inconvenience and uh, they can increase nuclear radiation in a certain area. In some cases, the calculations are that if you stay in that same area where the dirty bomb has gone off for 40 years nonstop, your chance of getting cancer might go up by one percentage point. If that's your idea of a good time, OK. You know. <laughs> so they're, they're basically not very they, – they, they, in fact, people who look at it frequently say they're not no evidence of mass destruction because they don't destroy anybody in, uh, uh, in terms of uh, property or people. Um, and where they're, they're weapons of mass disruption that if you have an area which has elevated radiation risk, then – and we have extremely conservative standards about that. You might have to evacuate it and that would be really costly. Well, I, and, and, and the cleanup would take forever because the cleanup has to go down to super, super clean standards. I had, I had heard that under – if you put a dirty bomb in in Central Park, uh, most people – I mean maybe, depending on how it was made. But it's easy to die from making them too if you're trying to get that much yeah. concentrated material. But uh, because I'm from Denver, I, I have a higher uh, level Definitely. of radiation because I'm from Denver. So it would be – most people would get about the level of radiation that I got from living yeah. in Denver. And that was, that's another really fascinating thing in your book. Uh, you discuss um, uh, Jose Padilla arrested in 2002. This is quoting who apparently mused at one point about creating a dirty bomb, a, de- a device that would disperse radiation or even possibly an atomic one. His idea about isotope separation was to put uranium into a pail and then to make himself into a human centrifuge by swinging the pail around in great arcs. This is this seems uh, that's unbelievable the, because it's, it's fairly typical uh, mentality of these guys. Uh, it's, it's unbelievable. Now, what about biological weapons? This seems to mean we have anthrax and small, but this would devastate. Yeah, but they, they, the they, world. They, 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 these been no, these have been known for centuries, essentially, um, and uh, there's been very little use of it. The problem is they're very hard to control and they're very often very unstable. Anthrax spores do last a long time, but most of them don't. Uh, they can uh, the effect can be massively reduced by having just some wind in the area. So and the military hates them because they're hard to they're so hard to control and they also contaminate the area they're in. And uh, uh, terrorists seem to I mean, the case with Am Shinriko, for example, is a really good case. This is a, a millennial cult in um, in Japan 
that decided it wanted to blow up the world or something, you know, Armageddon, whatever. Um, and so they first tried to get nuclear weapons. They even bought a, or leased a uranium mine in Australia, for example, and they, they couldn't get off first base on that. So then they went to biological weapons and they actually worked on some and even set some off a couple of times. Uh, the weapons were let off. Not only did they not do any damage, but no one even noticed, which has got to be really deflating if you're a terrorist. <laughs> um, and in fact, the head of Am Shinrico said, all this stuff about biological weapons is disinformation <laughs> coming out of the SCIA. They want us to work on biological weapons because they're so difficult. And then they moved eventually to chemical weapons uh, and had great difficulties with that and then finally set off a few uh, very crudely in uh, – in the subway in an enclosed area in, sub in Japan, killed a few people and were arrested and then finally t closed down. So the difficulties are very high. If you want to be a terrorist, uh, some people, some terrorists have said, you know, keep it simple. Use things you know how you're doing. And that's why if there's a scary thing about the uh, – particularly about um, uh, Mumbai or about the Kenya attack and, and particularly now with Paris, it's that relatively uh, simple – uh, easy to manage. You don't have to have a lot of training or leadership or anything else. It can be pretty spontaneous and it can be impro improvised as you go along and doesn't take advanced technology. You just have to have a gun uh, or it can be a knife or something else uh, and know how to use it and it doesn't take a lot of training. You're not trying to shoot you know, careful targets or anything. You're just trying to kill people or have people walking around the street. It's not, a, it's, not a, it's not rocket science. So given that, given that terrorism is – I mean We've been talking about the threat is overblown, but there still is a threat. There are clearly people out there who would like to kill Westerners if they could. What would an alternative, much more effective and efficient way to fight this threat look like? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> well, I, I, I suppose the first thing to think about is is actually what are the risks of terrorism. And then how that and, and how's that compared to other hazards that we're exposed to? Then that gives us the basis for actually do we need to invest in this area or maybe should we invest, you know, in in tornado shelters or flood levees or some other or some other way that can that can that can uh, save lives. So that the, the risk of being killed by terrorists in the United States over the last 30, 40 years, including nine eleven, is about one in one in four million. In Australia, it's about one in seven million per year. Per year, uh, if you look at and in the United States post post nine eleven, the risk of being killed is one in one hundred and ten million. They're very low numbers. If you're looking at um, aviation security, uh, the the risk of, of being a, an airline passenger passenger that that, that's, that gets killed and, and a flight that's either hijacked or blown up is about one in ninety million. Ninety. One in ninety million. Or in other words, you have to fly every day for sixty eight thousand years. <laughs> before you be involved in any sort of ter any sort of terrorist incident at, at a plane or, or airport, and yet we never hear these sort of facts discussed openly at all. Uh, John and I go to a lot of security conferences, and mo quite often the byline is risk, you know, risk management, security risk management, risk based, risk everything based, everything everything risk based, risk. <laughs> and we are the only speakers who start the talk by saying these are the numbers. This is the basis for a discussion. Now, now, maybe you're happy with these numbers. Maybe you think they're too high. If you think they're too high, why do you think they're too high? And then what can be done about it? Or maybe you think that you know there might be might be something that we can tolerate. I mean, you don't accept a risk. No one likes to accept any risk. Um, but there's a large amount of research and and consensus in terms of low probability, high consequence events with nuclear power. Um, um, medical te technologies, you know, environmental pollution, where difficult choices, difficult choices have to be made about, you know, where do you invest the, the resources and funds to maximise the life-saving potential of any regulation, and we just don't see that debate happening at all. So, yeah, and that's really absurd. It should be because basically, if you want to put seat belts in the back seat of a car, you have to explain how many lives it's going to save, but and, we, how much, and what's the cost, and that's not being done for terrorism. So we have that debate in other areas like with cars and people Absolutely. are really – perfectly medicine. willing to admit like – so you can say like, well, if we wanted to cut down auto accidents, we could force everyone to drive five miles an hour and people are like, well, it's not worth that in order to prevent these things. But it does seem like there's something different about a terrorist threat versus a car accident or you know, the threat of hurricanes if you live in certain parts of the country or other kinds of risky – 
activities you can engage in and that's that there's – there's an agency behind it. Like terrorism is scarier because it's another person who wants to do us harm and it's not the kind of individual personalized harm of like, oh, my ex-spouse may get mad and attack me. But you know, there are people out there who want to hurt a lot of us indiscriminately and that's I legitimately potentially terrifying in a way that the threat of earthquakes – or car accidents is not. Is there something to that and does that difference in the nature of the threat, should that factor into the way we approach preventing it? Well, I wanted to actually add to that too because, because we have people who shoot people um, obviously too much uh, in America in, in, in bad situations but they, but they don't have in their mind – Hating America or, or hating us for our freedoms are these sort of like things that people say that the Harris want or wanting to destroy America. There are people who kill people, but that's not their goal. They're just psychotic. So we don't worry about that. But then if you do the same thing, but you have something in your mind that's different, it's somehow worse. So it kind of dovetails off of Aaron's question. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. Um, that I mean, if it, I mean, yes, terrorism arises, it exposes so many emotions and, and risk aversion, particularly. But then so does like nuclear, nuclear energy. And so there's been a large amount of debate over the last 40 years in, in the US. There's a debate in Australia at the moment and elsewhere about you know, where do you put a nuclear, nuclear power station? What are the risks of something going wrong? How do you safeguard it? Who pays? Who benefits? Um, you know, local jobs versus, versus the risks. And there's and there's public meetings and it's very controversial and people people get angry and they take and they take different sides, but it's all done in an open, transparent manner. No one's no one's trying to hide anything, and so you really have a mature debate about it. You might you might not agree with the, with the outcome. So terrorism should be treated in a similar aspect. Sure, there are, there are things that make it unique, but there are aspects that are very similar to other highly emotive public policy decisions out there. And I suppose I mean the work in our book is we trying to say well this is a framework that's been used for for other emotive issues, and if you apply the same framework for terrorism, this is sort of where where it tries to lead us, and particularly when it comes to, to risk aversion, you know you know I can be risk averse, I can decide I don't want to climb a mountain because I just don't think it's you know, or go skiing, well I can't ski but anyway, um, <laughs> very good enough really. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, but governments—they need to be—they don't need to be quite as pessimistic when they're spending public money. So, you know, if there's a way that, you, that you're guaranteed to save X number of lives by investing in, in tornado shelters, rather than maybe only saving a couple of lives, maybe for some new counterterrorism policy, then they should pick the tornado shelters. Now, they may be concerned about how that looks in terms of their, their politics and their electoral chances, but that's. That's not what they were really meant meant to do. Yeah, and let me just add to that. There's a study by the by the there's a commission by the Department of Homeland Security about how much a life for terrorism is worth. Which and, other agencies do all the time? In yeah, all the time. Right. How much is life worth? It's not. It's not an infinite. Uh, you know, save one life is not an infinite good. I mean, you have because. You can save lots of lives with the same amount of money, uh, which you might do the one. But anyway, they, they conclude roughly, which is fairly standard, about uh, human life is worth about five or six or seven million dollars. And they suggest that to add to that, because the terrorism proposes exactly what you've been talking about, special anxieties and so forth, that it be doubled. So it's like $14 million per life or 15. So you can do that. And we do that. We also, um, uh, the uh, it's a little bit tricky because some terrorist attacks, like nine eleven or like the French case, really create a huge amount of of uh, anxiety. But the shootings at Fort Hood, the big, worst attack in the United States since nine eleven, it's hard to see that people got very anxious. Uh, there's definite costs. Obviously, some people were killed and property damage, but it didn't cause people to not to f go to Texas because they're afraid of being shot or anything, and they, it didn't create a lot of anxiety. So. What we usually prefer to do is look at certain kinds of attacks uh, that seem to have uh, – some, some of them have uh, – basically look at them individually. This seems to have a fair amount of uh, this emotional impact and others don't and uh, to deal with it in, in those terms. So you can, you can include it. What you can't do is simply say life is infinitely valuable. And you have to, and but no one. And, and, I mean, the physicians, you know, prescribing things, you know, there's a small chance they give you this vaccination will kill you. 
and they tell you that, you know, and so forth. and so that kind of calculation is there, should be there, and is very important. And the fact that no one talks about acceptable risk is bizarre. The only time we found really a public discussion of acceptable risk is by John Pistol of the uh, when he's head of the T Transportation Security Administration. And they were calculating that uh, there's a, they were trying to put in these scanners that had x-rays in them and the x-rays could give you cancer. So they had it checked out and said, can it give you cancer? And, they, and he said, no, it's perfectly safe. It's not perfectly, not perfectly safe. He said acceptably safe because we've looked at it very carefully and we had experts at MIT and so forth look at it and they say the, the risk is perfectly OK. So uh, Mark basically looked – There's, it, it's pretty – straightforward to figure out what the risk is because you know what the dose is and there's standards, things that are also extremely conservative but they're out there and they're accepted by the nuclear regulatory agency and the, and the uh, government agencies. And so what's the chance of getting cancer from a single scan? And it comes out to be one in 60 million. Well, then as Mark said, pointed out, what's the chance of being killed by a terrorist? <laughs> it's one in 90 million. And if one in sixty million is acceptable risk, why isn't one in ninety million? Acceptable but that's but that's with I mean the, the idea is that it's one in ninety million when you have scanners in, in airports. Yeah. It's it's, it's well, lower if you didn't have scanners in airports. Well, no, no. Uh, like the, it, the, well, it raises the having scanners in airports raises your the, the chance that it makes it less likely you'll be killed by terrorists. Yeah, except that the, the data come from before the mostly before the scanners even existed. So it's not clear that they've added that much uh, to the. Uh, Risk they reduce the risk that much. So we have a, 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 a again a sensitive situation now with Paris, um, and we also have a situation with which which has captured the world's imagination uh, probably more than almost any uh, terrorist attack since nine eleven. Um, we or at least the Western world. Uh, we also have a sensitive situation with what France is going to do, and we also have a Syrian refugee issue that's all getting wrapped up in this. What, what do you fear about what will happen? Post Paris, and then also how we're going to deal with the refugee problem uh, in light of this horrible mm -hmm. event. Uh, yeah, the what the concern is basically overreaction. I mean, the overreaction to nine eleven included not only the huge amount of increase of security spending without examination that Mark noted, but also the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, which have ended up with the deaths of far more Americans that died on 9-11, not to mention, obviously, the far higher death tolls for Afghans, Afghanis and for uh, Iraqis. Um, and so the, the French are making all kinds of screaming, hollering things and how much – including increasing surveillance and uh, – being able to arrest people just because they don't look right and so forth. Uh, and um, so there's a danger of that, uh, basically that overreaction which costs a lot of money and also has a lot of civil liberties implications. And if it involves getting – throwing things at the wars in the Middle East, it can be extremely costly. I mean the war in, the war in, in Iraq has cost several trillion dollars and it's still going on. And so that's – that. I, I'm worried that that might happen. The experience suggests probably that it won't be as bad as that. But uh, the, the most important – actually, what you find is the most effective counterterrorism measure is to not overreact. It, it, that doesn't mean don't react at all. Terrorism is a problem. You want to deal with it. It's a, the terrorists do exist. They do kill people. Uh, and uh, so it's a, it's a public hazard that should be dealt with by people in charge of public safety. But it should be done in a responsible manner, the way other uh, hazards have been examined and simply hasn't been done. Thank you for listening. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.